Malaysians love their food. Seriously, we'd marry nasi lama if we could. If it didn't already cheat on us with roti canai every morning. But what if our beloved dishes are slowly killing us? So for the next 24 hours, I'm going to test how our favorite Malaysian dishes affect my blood sugar levels. And the results are spicy. This is a continuous glucose monitor and it's going to be my personal food diary for the next 24 hours. Just our applicator, some accessories. Oh, safety launch button. Oh, the petrol. Okay, got it. That's a pretty scary needle. Press it. Oh, I'm scared. Oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. So throughout the day of eating classic Malaysian dishes, this device will be tracking what all that food is going to do to my blood sugar levels. And if I'm on the path to being a pre-diabetic patient, Growing up, I've always had an unhealthy relationship with sugar, gravitating to the sweeter items in the fridge. I just assumed that because I was skinny, all the sugar was getting burned off. But is that really the case or am I causing irreversible damage without even realizing it? With Malaysia being one of the most obese and diabetic countries in Southeast Asia, I'm undertaking this challenge to shed some light on one, what our favorite Malaysian dishes do to my blood sugar, two, to better understand the relationship of blood sugar and our daily lives, and three, what can we do about it? Let's go get some breakfast. Boss, now order roti bakar. What better way to start off the day than with my personal favorite breakfast of all time? Kaya butter toast and half boiled eggs. We're here at Uncle Lim's and as far as chain restaurants go, I do think they have one of the best toast spreads in Malaysia. If you think otherwise, you're probably wrong. I don't know how anyone can look at this meal and think it's unhealthy. A moderate amount of carbohydrates, plenty of protein from the eggs, lots of fat from the butter and as well as the egg yolks, but most importantly, a shit ton of sugar from all the kaya in here. At first glance, there's nothing suspicious, but let's see what it does to my blood sugar. First things first, first you crack the eggs into this bowl, scoop up all the extra egg. We're not wasting a single gram of protein, guys. Then you add a little bit of soy sauce, some white pepper, mix it right in with the egg whites. Dunk it as much as you want, swirl it and enjoy. Mm. The bread has the right amount of toast to it. It's light and airy when you chew into it. Doesn't feel like you're eating so much bread. Kaya is super sweet. Coupled with the egg yolk and the butter, so creamy. And to top it off, te tare. Surprisingly not so sweet. It's gonna take about 30 minutes to about a couple hours to see the full effects of this meal on my blood sugar. So let's keep a close eye on this app and see what happens. For over a century, kaya butter toast has been a beloved part of Malaysia's cultural heritage. Just look at these kids, completely hooked on its high sugar goodness. It's been about half an hour since I had the meal and my blood sugar is spiking to 142. So the normal range is anywhere from 70 to 100 in a fasted state and anywhere from 100 to 140 after a meal. Here we're hitting 142, which is a little bit on the high side. We still have two more meals to go. I'm getting all that sugar rush. My brain actually feels like really active and I really want to get stuff done. Let's check back in like an hour or two to see how my energy levels stabilize or get worse. While the initial burst of energy in my system made me feel like I could tackle any challenge thrown my way, things quickly took a turn for the worst. It's been about two hours since breakfast and my blood sugar is crashing. It's currently at 106 milligrams per deciliter, which is a little bit lower than what it was in the morning. And I can feel it. I'm struggling to pay attention to do work. I'm just on my phone. I did have the energy before to do a bunch of things and to get some work done. But now that the sugar crash is, is hitting, I can feel that the, the, the brain is having a difficult time focusing. What's interesting is I'm starting to get a little bit of signals from my body of hunger. I don't think I'm that hungry, but the brain's just giving out those signals because of the crash because it really wants to stabilize itself. I had to do something about this sugar crash ASAP, but before that... If you guys are enjoying this video, please hit that subscribe button. I'm on a road to 10,000 subscribers. My goal this year is to monetize this YouTube channel so that we can grow this team and to keep producing even better quality content for you guys. With that, let's go get some lunch. It's raining. It's raining. But you know what? Rain will never stop Malaysians in getting the food that they want. Yeah, it's pretty heavy shit. Rain or shine, day or night, it's always a good time for nasi lemak. Let's hope the spiciness doesn't do as much damage to my blood sugar levels as the gin. Tambal, cambalis, peanuts, cucumbers, eggs, chicken. I don't know what this is, but it all goes together. Some fragrant rice, classic nasi lemak. Sambal is a little bit sweet, a little bit spicy. The ikan bilis is as crispy as it can be. Do you guys eat the nasi lemak with or without sambal? 
This is what we call syrup bandung. It's rose syrup mixed with milk, and the milk really helps to cut the spiciness. If you're somebody like me who doesn't have a very high spice tolerance, this drink is so sweet it could double as a bribe in Malaysian politics. The current level is at 106. Let's see what it gets to by the end of this meal. I was not prepared for what's to come. Just 30 minutes later, my blood glucose levels is spiking to 146 milligrams per deciliter. Feeling like I was on the verge of developing diabetes, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper to better understand the relationship between our food and blood sugar levels. When we eat any form of carbohydrates, our body turns those carbohydrates into glucose, our fuel for energy. Think of this one cup of white rice. When it's broken down, our body turns it into about 45 grams of glucose, or about 11 teaspoons of sugar. Glucose isn't bad, it's essential. Our brains, although only 2% of our total body weight, accounts for 20% of our total energy expenditure, and our body loves glucose. That's why your brain craves sugary foods. It's like a quick shot of energy. But here's the problem. Sugary snacks and drinks cause quick spikes in blood sugar followed by rapid drops. And when your blood sugar crashes, your brain senses this as an energy emergency and signals to your body to eat more sugary snacks to stabilize itself. This creates a vicious cycle of cravings, overeating and unstable energy levels. In a balanced 2000 calorie diet, you eat about 280 grams of carbohydrates in a day. That's about 70 teaspoons of sugar that your body needs as glucose. But when we add sugary drinks or snacks into the mix, we overload our system, feeding this cycle and creating insulin resistance, potentially leading to diabetes. It's like filling a car with too much gasoline. It overflows, potentially damages the engine, and it's just a waste of fuel. So the next time you have any sugary sides, think of it as pouring sugar directly into your body's engine. It's been about three hours since lunch. My levels spiked to a high of 155. It's currently crashing really hard. My energy levels are dipping. Despite drinking a lot of water, I can definitely feel craving for sugary items. This second spike is not fun. I don't know if I can continue on this challenge. I got some snacks. There was a market nearby that was selling a lot of snacks and I just couldn't resist. I mean, just look at it. Look at the colors. I don't know what this is, but I think it's something wrapped in sugar. Pretty much, I'm just asking for diabetes. This is just some layered cake. I'm gonna go for this one first. All the brown sugar inside. Honestly, I don't know what is in any of these, but they're delicious. Okay, maybe that wasn't the wisest choice. I'm having another glucose spike at 155 again, although I just had one piece of snacks. So you know what? I'm gonna have some pre workout. I'm gonna hit the gym. Let's try and burn off all the sugar, shall we? With that much sugar in my system, I wasn't just lifting weights, I was defying medical science. I had become a ticking time bomb of diabetes, one rep away from detonation. But somehow, instead of crashing, I was hitting new PRs. Plates that once felt immovable were now flying up like they owed me money. I annihilated hack squats to the point where I was seeing stars. Or maybe it was just my pancreas crying for help. But as the high of newfound strength faded, reality set in. No matter how hard I trained, no matter how much sweat I left on that gym floor, I knew dinner was coming and dinner would undo everything. At this point, I had to accept the truth. My chances of developing diabetes were higher than my chances of growing my calves. And that's a reality no amount of leg day can change. My blood glucose level right now is at 90 milligrams per deciliter. It's the lowest it has been all day. Let's see if the last meal of today is going to wreak havoc on my body. We're having none other than Nasi Kanda Pelita. Whether you just crushed a gym session or stumble out of a club, a late night Nasi Kanda meal feels both sinful and satisfying. But as satisfying as this guilty pleasure was, the real test would come the next morning, when I'd have to face the aftermath of what all this food had done to my blood glucose levels. I did not expect these results at all. So last night, I finally went to bed at around 4 a.m. I woke up at about 10 a.m. this morning. You know how when you kind of wake up and you're just like... That was how I felt this morning. My blood sugar level seemed to be pretty stable throughout the night though. It was around 88 to about 90 throughout the night. Reflecting on the past 24 hours, I've learned a lot about how a sugar-heavy diet can really affect my energy levels. You know, after looking at the huge spikes and the rapid drops in this graph, the way I look at food and sugar has completely changed because if this is what's happening in my body every day, I can't imagine the damage that I could be doing in the long run. I can already feel the effects of eating like this for just 24 hours and I can't imagine what's going on in the bodies of millions of Malaysians that eat like this every single day. The biggest takeaway that I have from this challenge is understanding the signals that my body has been giving me 
all along. All those cravings, all those crashes, all those procrastination, it's not normal. It's my body signaling to me that I'm having too much sugar. I was stuck in a vicious loop, mistaking temporary fixes for real energy. What may seem like an innocent meal was wreaking havoc on my body and my blood sugar level and I didn't know anything about it until I completed this challenge. Luckily, I've come to this realization before it was too late. While I have not developed diabetes, this challenge has showed me that I could have easily been heading down that path. Over a long period of time, eating those sort of foods every day, this could have turned out very differently. This was definitely the wake-up call that I needed. So now I'm more determined to build a healthier relationship with sugar. I'm not going to cut it out entirely. I still like my sugar. But learning what I have from these challenges, I can now make more well-informed decisions about what I decide to put into my body as fuel. And my body will thank me for that by providing more stable energy levels throughout the day. Our Malaysian food isn't just delicious, it's part of our identity. But maybe it is time we redefine what health means in our culture.